All right, so I'll just give a, a, an overview of what Brown Dog is, and if Murphy doesn't strike me down, I'll also give a demo, and Luigi Marini as well, of what we're at, where we're at so far. So Brown Dog, uh, as uh, Dave was suggesting, the, the name comes from the fact that it's a, a super mutt of software. We're, n we're not going to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of tools out there that do file format conversions. There's a lot of tools out there that do analysis on data in terms of contents and pull something interesting out of it. And the idea for Brown Dog is basically to build the framework, uh, the infrastructure, to kind of pull all those things together in an elegant manner uh, and do so in a manner that's easy to extend uh, and easy to add new pieces and scalable so that you can potentially run it on large collections. So just briefly, uh, this is the NSF ACI, uh, Advanced Cyber Infrastructure Directorate Data Program. Uh, about five years ago, they started the first round of the DataNet Awards. Uh, if you're familiar with those, uh, there were two of them initially, Data One and the Data Conservancy. Uh, these were largely focused around taking existing software and building communities around them. Uh, later, uh, uh, two years later, another, another round of DataNet Awards were made. Uh, the Data Federation Consortium, uh, Terra Populous, and Seed, Seed, which were a part of as well. Uh, and basically, uh, these continued that e effort of basically taking existing software and building communities around them. So for example, Seed, uh, NCSA, Medici, and Vivo are part of that project uh, and building a, a infrastructure around those things. So uh, just last year, uh, nine months ago actually, uh, was the latest round of this effort, basically the data infrastructure building blocks. These are a little bit different than the data nets in that their, their purpose primarily is to build software. Uh, and so Brown Dog is one of the four that were actually funded out, out of this. We've invited another of these, Carol Song from uh, Purdue. She's uh, another PI of one of these projects. Uh, has to do with Hub Zero, which we think integrates well with what we're doing as well. And so the idea of the building blocks, and it's similar with the data nets, is that they're all kind of these building blocks that they kind of fit together. They don't do the same thing per se. They build off one another towards building some grander picture, something like a national data service. And so uh, we're one of those blocks. And again, as I mentioned previously, is we're kind of on the early end of data with the terms of uh, getting access to files in terms of their contents, out independent of the format and finding those files after the fact through indexing uh, when there's no metadata present. So this is a collaboration between uh, NCSA, the University of Illinois, Boston University, and the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Uh, these are the co-PIs of the project. They're all present here in the room uh, today, so you can talk with each of them. Uh, these are the people on the project, uh, and all our uh, developers uh, here at NCSA and at, at UNC. Uh, and our graduate students. So we have 10 funded graduate students as part of this project. They are involved with the use cases and the research that will leverage and do new science based off what we're provi providing with Brown Dog. So the problem, what, what, what is uh, Brown Dog addressing? This is kind of the general problem that NSF is addressing these days, why it's investing so much money in uh, data. So basically well, the problem here is that the scientific method. So the scientific method, as you know, is the question, hypothesis, testing, procedure, analysis, results. Uh, basically, the idea here, what makes science science, is that when that procedure, the documented procedure, is re-executed in the future, one obtains the result, the documented result, every single time. And so the problem today is that all science, pretty much all science everywhere, uh, uses digital data and software. The problem is both these things have lifespans. Uh, and the idea here is that after some period of time, relatively short periods of time in the information age, uh, that software, that digital data is no longer accessible. And basically, if you were to try to recreate that experiment, uh, you couldn't. You could not reproduce the results. So this uh, has NSF very concerned, and it's why it's investing so much money in this thing. And so we're addressing that in terms of uh, data here, and specifically the problem we're looking at is what is often termed as long tail data, uh, uncurated, unstructured data collections. Think of a hard drive with a bunch of files on it, you have no idea what's there, uh, no useful file names, no useful directory, oops, sorry, no, no useful directory structures, uh, Weird file formats, old file formats, uh, basically a mess to go through, no metadata. So what, do you, what can you do with that data? How can you find anything that you want? And if you can't find anything you want, how can you use it? Um, so what is needed is basically some means of, dis so going, getting down into the weeds here, what's needed is basically some means of, if you have the data, some means of deciphering the bytes to make, uh, to, to make sense of it. So basically you don't really care how the bytes are stored on a disk, on a tape drive, or so forth. You care about the contents of that, uh, of that file. So is there an image in there? Is there a depth map in there? Is there a 3D model in there? Is there a table in there that I want to pull out? So in computer science terms, that's more or less the data structure that you pull out of it and store into memory and then do stuff with. So you, you want those pixels, you want those points, and so forth. So uh, what you also need is a means of indexing those contents in the case of large collections, which is what we're dealing with here. So you have a bunch of files, you have no idea what's in there. How do I find the piece of data that you actually care about, uh, the ones relevant to your research? 
So to do that, you need some way of uh, knowing what's in the files. Uh, in so once you have the contents, what is that? Con what's in there? So is it is this picture a picture of a tree? Is this picture a picture of a field or a map? Or is it some document with some text in it? Stuff like that. So uh, these are kind of what's necessary for that. So towards that, what's basically needed is uh, well, with regards to file formats, what you need is what's called the specification of the file format. You need the way of defining what the, each individual byte is inside of the file that means X, Y, Z. So this is a pixel, this is a character, and so forth and so forth. That's what's needed. When that's not there, what you also need oftentimes is the actual software that was used to create and view that data. Uh, so basically, uh, what, file, uh, what program was used to make this data, to view it, to open it, and to modify it, and so forth like that. And when the so once you get software involved, what you also then need is the execution environment. Was it run on Windows? Was it run on Windows 95? Was it run on Windows NT? So forth. Was it run on a Mac? Was it run on Linux? Uh, the libraries associated with the entire in uh, environment associated with that. And so, uh, so that's kind of just for the first step in terms of getting access to the contents, independent of the file formats. And then there's the metadata aspect, what's in the content. So what you need is metadata. You need uh, some piece, some keywords, some tags saying that there is uh, something inside of this piece of file, this file that indicate, lets you know uh, whether you even care about it. So that you can search through a billion of these files and find stuff that you want. So when putting together Brown Dog, we also considered a number of additional considerations that make up this landscape of the problem we're dealing with here in terms of science uh, in the information age. And just towards kind of building a solution that kind of encompassed a whole bunch of these things at once uh, and not just very specific stuff to the file formats and metadata. So uh, one of the additional considerations, as I already mentioned, is that software is very much a factor in this. So when you don't have the specification, when you often do not, uh, the software is very important. You need the software that made it. Uh, and this could also be custom software that's made in your labs uh, that your students make. Uh, obsolete operating system. So the software runs on this operating system, this platform that no longer exists. That's an important factor now. So I want to rerun that software. I need that environment. Uh, storage requirements. So when you start talking about storing environments, you're talking about usually virtual machines, and they're usually pretty big. Uh, so there's uh, tools out there like Docker, which kind of make that smaller, but there's, there's still things you have to store. So storage requirements for the environment, for the software that you need to access the data, is something you have to keep in mind. So you need storage for just that stuff, independent of the data as well. So uh, you all, there's also the fact that software is no longer available. Software goes away. Companies die. Uh, what are you going to do then? You still need that software if they made the data and there's no specification for the data format. Software licensing. A lot of this stuff is commercial stuff. How are you going to contend with that? So you, can you save a piece of software that has a license that was sold commercially? Well, if it was 10 years ago, maybe. I don't, probably not still. You have to work that kind of stuff out within the industry partners. Uh, with regards to file formats, there are a whole bunch of file formats. There are thousands of these things many for the same exact type of data. So many formats for images, many formats for 3D data, many formats for tables and numeric data, and so forth. You have to contend with that. There's a lack of standards for formats, or if there is standard, standards, there's often this issue of enforceability. Can I force somebody to use this uh, particular file format? Sometimes sorta, uh, oftentimes not so much. Uh, there's large complex file formats. So if I'm gonna support all these different file formats in the world, I have to, and if, ideally if I had the specifications for them, I could take a team and develop the code to read them. Uh, that's also a problem. There's a lot of them, and they often have large, complex specifications. For example, one 3D file format we've, often, we've dealt with in the past called STEP has a 2,000-page specification. So th that's a daunting task, and when you consider other aspects, like the fact of commercial formats, you don't even have the specification, or old formats, the specification was lost. So that's something to consider as well. So un unavailable format specifications. Uh, also, the, there's also this idea of there's this Ease, there's this ease in creating data. There's this sense of reward for creating data. There's not so much this sense of reward for curating data, for assigning metadata to it, to putting in, giving it proper file names, to putting it in a proper archive and such like that. There's, you get tenure by producing results and making data. You don't get tenure so much for archiving stuff. Not yet. So was, was the, towards stuff like the National Data Service, that hopefully is the case. But not yet. And so that's something to contend with as well. Uh, there's different met so when there is metadata, there's also different metadata standards. So how do you deal with that? How do you map from one to the other? And so forth. Uh, uh, so there's also the idea of the software that's being uh, developed. Uh, uh, first of all, the software that you're preserving, preserving that software, but also um, assuring the, uh, that the software that you're building, the software we're building, like for Brown Dog, preser preserving that itself also. So and this is a five-year project. After five years, if that goes away, what good was it really towards curating data? Uh, so basically, that's something to contend with as well. Um, 
And so just a number of, so those are kind of, that kind of makes up the landscape of, of stuff as we see it in terms of this data uh, concerns in the scientific community. There's also a couple notions that we throw in at the end here to kind of keep in mind. There's this growing notion towards the need for academic reward towards uh, um, the software, towards uh, publishing your software, towards getting credit for that software, towards maybe getting tenure off the software you build. So this is something that we are keeping in mind here as well, and it's part of the brown dog equation as we're building this software uh, for uh, curation of data, uh, file formats and metadata. Uh, there's also this idea, which is essential, is the idea is that science builds off of the work of others uh, and, and um, uh, possibly crossing into other disciplines. So the idea of reuse. So using, reusing software tools that, in other domains, that where you, didn't, you, you don't think it's useful right now, but someone else in the future might think it's very valuable. So kind of keeping this in mind in terms of preserving tools, not just so that you can reproduce your results or others reproduce your specific results, but reuse your tools for completely different things, uh, for completely different domains, different data sources. And there's also this consideration of a lot of the stuff that we'll talk about here today is gonna require computation. The analysis of data, the pulling out of, uh, and examining the contents of data, pulling out metadata, uh, especially when large collections are involved, is gonna require compute. And this is really in the form of cloud compute in this case, mostly. So we need computational resources uh, to do that kind of thing. And this is something that we would uh, take care of in the back end for, in terms of the users, you shouldn't have to see this, but it's a part of the equation as well. And also there's this uh, need to actually move data around, large uh, uh, collections of data from where it's gonna be, uh, where, it, where it exists, to where the compute actually is potentially. Uh, of course, trying to minimize that, because as we all know, it's, I, I, we're moving towards this idea of moving compute towards the data. Uh, and we have actually a couple of members of the Globus team here too, which actually specifically deal with this idea of moving data around efficiently. So that's uh, another building block that would kind of come into this equation. So what does Brown Dog address? So Brown Dog looks at all, what we did was we looked at all those considerations and kind of put together a couple of uh, pieces that kind of attacked a number, a subset of those at one time, a kind of a multi-pronged approach to solving those and assuming this is kind of like a large nonlinear problem here. Uh, and attack those and try to make something that's useful for users in terms of dealing with these kind of data. So the first is the idea of accessing data contents with lacks of standards and file formats. So this is, this is basically this curation, this uh, uh, conversion engine, this universal extensible conversion engine, which we call the data access proxy and which we'll talk about a bit later. The other is this idea of discovering and finding data with lack of curation. So it's a mess, it's, nobody curated it. Uh, still being able to use this data while also considering the need to preserve the software a preserved software that scientists make and providing credit for that software development. So the idea here is taking analysis tools that exist in the community, using them, leveraging them as part of this data tilling service that'll make up this component, and also providing a way for scientists to get credit for others who use that, so uh, that software for novel research or even reproducing their research. And the last element is basically about what I was mentioning about preserving the software we're building ourselves, creating tools uh, for accessing uh, data while addressing the sustainability of that software itself. So I want to talk a little bit about that now. So basically the idea is Brown Dog, what we're building, the data access proxy and the data tilling service, an element of the proposal we put in it was its sustainability also. We wanted it to last, not just to die. And so what we proposed was basically considering uh, another use case, the general public. So looking back on the history of NCSA, a number of pieces of software have come out of here that are still in existence today from some number of years later. Uh, and uh, basically all of which had this general public use case to them. Well, not initially, but it ended up that way. So NCSA Telnet was a uh, popular means of accessing uh, remote machines. Uh, Mosaic, most of you should know about that. It was the one of the first popular graphical browsers which led on, went on to Netscape, which went on to Internet Explorer, which went on to Mozilla Firefox, and even pieces of Chrome. Uh, and so it, it today, those browsers encompass 45% of all uh, internet traffic, 84% of all internet traffic today. So it, it, it had an impact. Uh, and then HTTPD, which is basically what has served web pages. And so at the time of Mosaic, served around 90% of all web pages, and even today serves around 64% of all web pages. So from what I understand from talking to people here, all these things were made towards scientific needs. They were made to help people use supercomputers to access supercomputers. None of them are ever going to be remembered for that. They'll be remembered because my mother uses them, my grandfather uses them, my brothers and sisters use them. Everybody uses these things. They make up the, 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 the landscape of civilization today. And so they have this general public appeal. Scientists also use them. Every scientist uses a browser. It's probably uh, the way it's made data so accessible has probably led to this big data deluge that we're dealing with now in Brown Dog. But so that it's, it's, the fact is this general public use case has made this software persist. It doesn't exist here at NCSA anymore. It exists in the Apache Foundation. It exists uh, uh, elsewhere uh, in Microsoft, in uh, uh, Mozilla. 
And so God help you trying to destroy the software today. It exists everywhere, in code bases, in computers, everywhere. So we're trying to shoot for something like that. God knows if we'll succeed. We probably, who knows. But uh, th this is what we're kind of shooting for. We're trying to go in that direction. Can we repeat this? Can we make it so that we're building this software for scientific needs, but also throw into this this general public use case so that perhaps the software can sustain itself? So uh, basically, all these things kind of have in common. They're all funded to meet scientific needs. They all have this bro broad appeal to them, though. There's something that the general public can see benefit in. Maybe not at the beginning, too. It's maybe later on they kind of see benefit in. And they're all free, at least initially, uh, and open source pieces of software. So, uh, um, so that's kind of what we're shooting for here. And so with Brown Dog, what we're looking at is for is uh, something that kind of fits a role in the internet analogous to a domain name service. So a domain name service, if you're not familiar with that, is a piece of the internet. If it was ever to vanish, you'd notice it. Uh, basically what it does is it translates URLs. So you go to google.com, it translates it to the respective IP address so that your computer and the router knows where to actually go for that web page. Uh, if it was to disappear, you would type in google.com and you would go nowhere, you would notice it. And so this is an essential part of the internet. It, it's, it's, a distributed, it's a cute little piece of code, it's a distributed piece of code, it exists on a bunch of different machines and they kind of talk to each other, pass information around, but does this very simple purpose of translating this piece of text into these numbers. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is something along those lines. So the two services we're building, the data access proxy and the data net uh, tilling service, we're envisioning as fitting a role similar to that. So you don't usually do this these days, but before uh, people got really into DHCP, you would set up your IP address and your DNS service as part of your network configuration. And so what we envision here is modifying that. So uh, basically we would add two new services, the data access proxy and the data tilling service. You would provide IP addresses for those things. And what we're hoping to do is instantiate the first demonstration instance here at NCSA of those two services. And the idea then is basically, uh, they would be uh, eventually part of the internet. Uh, and they would, would make it so that it's a little bit easier for users, scientists and likewise, to be able to use data. And so the data access proxy, I'll just define that here, is basically this service, this highly extensible distributed service, cloud-based service, for carrying out five file format conversions. As I'll describe in a later talk today, it, the idea here is to literally use every piece of software out there that's capable of opening and saving another format and stick it together. Uh, so basically it's to move towards a world that's agnostic to file formats and, and to uh, um, aid in uh, accessing file contents independent of how they're represented on a disk. So I don't care how the image format is stored, I don't care how the table is stored, or the database is structured, I just want the data that's in it, that's all I care about. So it's gonna help you do that. And then there's the data tilling service. So again, another extensible and distributed service for the extraction of new data. So this, this service will again be made up of a bunch of different pieces, uh, a bunch of tools that basically examine the contents of data, of uh, files, uh, and basically spit out something else. Uh, whether it be a few numbers, a probability distribution, a tag, uh, another file, uh, doesn't matter. But the idea is that potentially some of that stuff is useful for then indexing the data and uh, searching amongst it. So we'll show a little bit of uh, what we mean there. So these two services encapsulate two ideas here. Uh, one is a data conversion. Uh, these are both transformations of data, but the data conversion we define is a transformation of digital data that largely preserves the entirety of data. So think of going from one file to another file where potentially you go backwards again. Now, of course, there's information loss involved here, and this is kind of how we started the, this project. But uh, ba basically, the idea is you could potentially, ignoring the information loss, go back and forth between the data. Uh, and then there's, uh, we define data extraction as a transformation on digital data, digital data which creates new data, often higher level data uh, from the contents of the data. So think of tags, think of signatures in terms of content-based retrieval that kind of describe what's in there, kind of a hash for what's in the, in the file. Not reversible. So the idea here is you maybe spitting out some text or maybe a, perhaps a derived product uh, that you can't go back to the original file with. So, uh, into, so how we see, so this is just some mock-ups before I go into a demonstration of what we have so far. But so in terms of the general public use case, just because it's easier to show, uh, what we have in mind here is so imagine a browser. Uh, so you have your data access proxy set up. Uh, you go to a web page, and this is a simple little example here, there's only one file in there, it's a doc, a uh, Microsoft document file. So of course, if you go to that file, you click on it, you have the options of opening that file or saving it to disk. So that is, you don't have the Microsoft Office on your machine. Uh, uh, and, and so basically, wouldn't it be nice if you could kind of just change the file name at the top to PDF? You have Acrobat installed on your machine. Of course, that's not gonna work, you're getting a 404 file not found. The idea here, though, is if you, with the data access proxy running in the background as the service, it would just work. It would look like that PDF actually exists there, even though it doesn't. The data access proxy would intercept that 404 not found and check if it has some software, some chain of software, potentially multiple pieces of software on multiple machines that can go from your source to your desired target format and carry it out on the fly, potentially. 
And so it would look like that file actually existed there. Uh, so you could do this with other things, so maybe a text file, a simple text file from that uh, doc, maybe render it as an image uh, so that you can just read it off of the image, render it as a sound file so that you can have it read to you using a text-to-speech engine somewhere out there in the cloud. Uh, uh, throw in a, data, uh, a spreadsheet in here as well. So just get that spreadsheet as a CSV file. Uh, get that spreadsheet as an HDF5 file. Uh, maybe do something more exotic, like get it as a SQL dump so that you can load it straight into a database. Uh, maybe load it straight into a serialized Java object so that you can load it into Java as a class. Uh, stuff kind of like that. So that's the idea behind the data access proxy. So the data tilling service, again, is about indexing uh, metadata where there is no metadata. So the way we kind of envision that occurring within a browser, and Luigi Marini will show you a, a demonstration of that, uh, is basically you have some web page you go to. You have some text, you have some images, you have some other random content on there. We, what, the idea here is we would, uh, once you have the data telling service set up, uh, you could do stuff like in the find box or in the omni box at the top is type in some keywords that are actually not present on the web page at all. And basically the data tilling service would go to the contents of the page, examine them, pull out pieces of information, and then you could query that on your web page and get back results here of stuff that match that. So that's in the case when there's uh, human readable tags. In the case when there's content-based signatures, these are like a numeric arrays that kind of describe the handwriting in the image, the color distribution in the image, stuff like that. For content-based retrieval, the idea here is uh, give, you would give it an example piece of, of, of content and find similar pieces of content in a collection. So the idea here is we would modify a, potentially a browser through a plugin so you can then drag and drop a piece of content on there on a web page and it would search through that web page, its children web page, all the links from it uh, that are under that web page. Uh, and it returned to you uh, all the things that kind of are similar to it in a rank order list where the topmost thing is the most similar, the bottom thing, next things are next most similar, and so forth. So the way of sifting through the page, none of this stuff on the right here actually exists on the page. Uh, it's actually being created by the data tilling service on, on the fly. So again, the data tilling service, what we're do building here, I have to emphasize, are services. So the idea is uh, they have a number of applications, a number of applications, applications we will build ourselves as well, will build off of these uh, towards doing, uh, making things easier for users uh, in terms of data. And so the data access proxy will primarily be built off of a REST interface, so basically a URL, where you would specify a particular desired output format and you would put a file there on that URL and it would just carry it out for you. Uh, the idea here again is file in, file out. You give it a file, you get a new file. And then the data tilling service, again, a, a REST interface to it over HTTP. Uh, basically, you specify uh, perhaps a domain so it's not doing all metadata on all different scientific domains, but maybe uh, civil engineering or maybe uh, 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 analysis tools from Michael Dietz's group, or stuff like, kind of like that. So uh, uh, basically, what you would do is then put a file there, and the idea is file in uh, JSON out. JSON is a way of representing arrays in Java, so it's just a bunch of stuff. And so it would contain text, uh, it would contain numeric signatures, it would contain URLs to other derived product files that you could then do something with. And with the idea of towards of finding uh, duplicates, the idea of indexing, uh, whatever. Uh, it's up to the application uh, to do that. So uh, again, uh, the idea is that these are services, they would pr primarily through a REST interface and a number of client applications uh, that build off of that uh, REST interface. And the idea also is we would back these up with computational resources. So the idea early on is, as these uh, pro, uh, services are being built, uh, what's the motivation for scientists to kind of put their tools in there to kind of uh, support it? Uh, the idea is uh, uh, backing up with comp computational resources. If you have some analysis that you could run on your desktop at s some speed, you could run it as part of this at some much more faster speed. And so by do doing that, uh, encourage the inclusion of new tools towards building up the service so that lots of people would want to use it. Uh, and uh, also serving a purpose as a place to preserve and reuse those tools so that you, the tools that you are in Brown Dog are, are preserved and reusable by other people who you wouldn't think of as wanting to use that tools. So uh, uh, really briefly, let me talk about uh, use cases. So we have three funded use cases in the project in addition to the general public use case. Uh, these span biology and ecology. This is with Michael Dietz, co-PI for that uh, here. Uh, civil environmental engineering with Praveen Kumar, who's uh, in the audience here and civil environment engineering slash social science with Barbara Minsker, who's in the audience here. And uh, all their students are here as well. And also we want to move towards all science. So this is the purpose of the workshop. So uh, the, the early user workshop is we want to know what else to support. What data file formats do we need to support early on? What uh, metadata, what analysis tools do you want in there so that you can find the data and the messes of files that you deal with that we could throw into there? And what we basically do is we'll find the synergies among what we hear back from you today and tomorrow, and kind of uh, ones we hear multiple times is ones we'll focus on. We'll throw developers at it and, and focus on those kind of things first. Uh, so uh, in terms of use cases, I just want to uh, bring up one of those. Uh, Michael Dietz will talk more about this later on. And it was kind of uh, one of the uh, uh, 
founding uh, motives for, uh, for this project as uh, why this kind of thing is needed. And so uh, he has a project called uh, a Pecan. Uh, David Labauer also involved in that is here as well. Uh, and basically uh, what that is is um, uh, a workflow system. So the idea is there's a whole bunch of models out there that model the environment, ecology. And uh, the idea here is to kind of, uh, uh, they use a number of different data sources. And the idea here is to prevent a nice user-friendly uh, graphical uh, workflow system where one could take a, a model and a bunch of different data sources and kind of mix and match them and uh, run, uh, run, run them uh, over the web. And so uh, there's a number of other aspects to it as well as to, with regards to you know, one model being right and kind of me measuring data sources and variable attributes, uh, noise and so forth. Michael talking about those things. He's the expert on those things. But, uh, but, but basically the idea from our standpoint is um, uh, there's a bunch of different models here and data sources uh, and they need to get the data from those data sources into the model. So currently there's a number of tools as part of the Pecan uh, suite that kind of do this conversion. Take the data from the native data sources, convert it into possibly an intermediary source, NetCDF is one they use, and then from that, net, uh, from that intermediary source to the specific formats that the models themselves want uh, to uh, actually run. So there's a lot of conversions actually happening there, and these are potentially things we would then pull into uh, Brown Dog. Uh, these are the, t the data sources that are listed here are largely structured data sources. They're uh, something a machine can read, uh, either databases or kind of text that can be parsed. And so uh, one thing Mike has also often talked about is unstructured data sources. So he's often mentioned like MODIS, which is multispectral satellite data, LIDAR data, Pulsar data, which is radar data, airborne spectrometry data, Landsat data, which is another satellite imagery stuff. These are unstructured data sources in that uh, computers uh, have a little bit harder time dealing with these kind of things. Uh, to its, uh, an image is just a bunch of pixels. It's a bunch of numbers. It, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't see stuff there. The whole field of computer vision is about making machines see stuff in images. And so there's uh, stuff that uh, it's, kind of, it's harder to deal with, and this is where uh, uh, analysis tools come into play into looking at those pixels and pulling out useful pieces of information. So Modus, for example, has some of that with their uh, products that they produce on their web page. But the idea is there's other stuff you could do those as well, more custom stuff that for particular researchers that we would build, that Mike would build, and then we could potentially save and reuse so that others could potentially use who didn't think they would need it in the first place. Same with LiDAR data and so forth. So the idea is here is where the data tilling service could capture some of this stuff to produce new uh, metadata kind of things. Uh, he's also mentioned uh, settlement vegetation data. So basically, basically these are old log books, uh, handwritten notes from, centuries ago, from a century ago. Uh, and basically this is, uh, so the data he typically works with are from, from the past decade. So the idea is uh, getting data from a century ago to kind of prime his models, to verify his models, to see that they're doing the right thing, to verify against. And so the idea would be to pull out the text from this data and to get numerical values as what it's possibly associated with and uh, to do something useful with that, as opposed to the typical process of doing these kind of things like with census data is to outsource it overseas where you have thousands of people manually type in stuff, or in his case, grad students, uh, basically get a machine to kind of in a scalable manner process these things and pull out this kind of information. So there's also paper forms, microfiche, uh, and so forth that we would kind of look at. Uh, in terms of file formats, these are a number of ones he's dealt with. Uh, it's not so important what they are, but what types they span. So there's document file formats, there's image file formats, there's spatial file formats, tabular file formats, weather data file formats, 3D file formats, archive database, file system dump file formats, and so forth. And the idea is there's also other stuff that he didn't list here that could potentially be that because they're similar data types. And there's also ad hoc file formats. Scientists love making up their own file formats. I did this as a grad student. So basically, you just kind of make up your own file format. And so it's just easier. And so you, there's all, these often span spreadsheets. So uh, basically, a spreadsheet with custom columns that mean things and headers that mean stuff that have information in them as well, uh, databases, R data dumps, MATLAB data dumps, and so forth. And so the idea is things, all that stuff needs to be preserved anyway. And so the way of documenting that and making sure that others in the future can still read that kind of stuff. So in terms of use cases, they have a general workflow to them. So the idea is there's this data collection, which is either on some website somewhere, or some file system, some hard drive on somebody's desk. Uh, and so basically that goes into, uh, uh, that has some span of file formats, uh, that some raw data to it, span file formats or database schemas or whatnot. And that, the da that's where the data access proxy would come in, to get that and get it out into another file format potentially uh, that's loadable. So I wrote data structure here. It's a computer science term for loading data into memory. Uh, and that's really what you want. So some file format where you can do that. And that's like arrays of numbers, strings, images in terms of pixels, videos in terms of frames, audio, and 3D models, and so forth. And so from that, now you have the contents, you understand what's in the file, uh, you could go for to the data tilling service to actually uh, index it. So pull out of that some tags that represent what's in that content. Pull out of that some signature that represents what's the con in the content. 
and from there find the data that you want, perhaps these things span analyses too, and go into some application which then uh, is probably your, uh, possibly your science. So uh, uh, basically as we move to the right, we're moving towards usable data from the raw data, which isn't usable. And so our use cases, which we'll go into, the, I'll let the use cases go into detail of what those are. These span from weather data into various formats to tabular data for getting out of that to possibly intermediate results or analysis results through the DTS. Uh, the handwritten vegetation example, which is a bunch of images, pulling out text and number values through the DTS. Uh, mode of satellite data, for example, again, images, and then pulling out of that land cover and usage information for climate modeling. Uh, LIDAR data, which has its uh, file format called LAS. Pulling out depth information uh, from that, uh, doing stuff like getting from that, uh, pulling out floodplain areas in the, stu in, the, in, the, in, the, in the LIDAR data possibly going back again and, and taking the product of that, which is like polygons encompassing areas where the floodplains exist on a map, and then doing some another analysis on that for maybe finding the depth distribution of the, of the floodplains and so forth. So Praveen Kumar's group will talk about that stuff, uh, and so forth and so forth. I'm gonna skip some of these, but I'm pretty sure I'm running out of time. And, and, and so uh, we have other use cases also with uh, which are looking at green infrastructure, uh, basically making infrastructure that also serves environmental needs. And so, uh, and also user appeal. And so basically taking synthetic images and, and measuring automatically uh, aesthetic appeal of those images in terms of what's actually in there and, and the environmental impact of those images. Generating those things, so they're basically taking 3D models of like uh, uh, buildings and shrubbery and putting those together with um, uh, actual environments and generating synthetic images for those using 3D models. Lots of 3D data out there, which I'll talk about later. Uh, and so that's an issue too, and basically getting the model out of that uh, towards that kind of thing, and so forth. And so uh, I'll just throw in this other, in terms of a, a, uh, another project which is not part of a Brown Dog, but we work with in our group, uh, with Scott Poole here in GroupScope, uh, is um, uh, in the social sciences, uh, basically studying large dynamic group behavior uh, empirically, uh, objectively, uh, rather than using surveys by using uh, videos of people interacting with one another. So lots of video formats out there as well. Uh, basically getting the videos uh, of the people interacting with each other, uh, getting the video out of it, and then analyzing it in terms of people and their interactions. Who's talking to who over X, over time X and Y, Z, and so forth. And so uh, these are kind of the examples we're talking about. And of course, the general public use case. So Steve Jobs presenting the iPad on NewYorkTimes.com. So stuff like this uh, doesn't happen anymore. So if Brown Dog was there, it wouldn't have happened. So it would have just shown up. So, so, so that, that's the kind of idea that we're going to um, kind of talk about throughout the day. Uh, if Murphy doesn't kill me, I'm going to show a demo now of, of, of what this kind of looks like. So um, let me start. Oh, I got logged out again. Hopefully nobody's, people aren't saturating the Wi-Fi. Uh, let me start up my service. So right now I have a, a couple virtual machines uh, running, using, uh, setting up the data access proxy and its, and its constituent pieces called a software server. Uh, and it's not meant for wide usage, so please God, don't use it now. You'll knock it over. Uh, but uh, it's good enough for a demo. So uh, the idea is that someday everybody will be able to use this. So what I'm going to do is basically go to a, start off with a couple of example web pages. So, uh, so here is one little example, and let me get another terminal open here, logged out again. And so what I'll do is go to where this web page is on this particular VM. So what I want to show is, again, these services are services. They're meant for a number of client applications that build off them. And so what I'm going to show you is two uh, applications. One is for web developers. So if, you don't, if you're not a web developer, you might not follow some of it, but I, I think it's pretty accessible. And the other is for everybody. So I'll show you that one uh, second. Uh, and so what I'm going to show you is uh, a simple piece of HTML. So that, here's a piece of HTML, and it's got some, basically some links in it. And uh, here's a PGM file. It's just a really simple file format, actually, but br browsers out of the box don't usually support it. Uh, uh, probably not. I'll, I'll switch to the browser in a minute. Don't you be Murphy John. <laughs> so. Uh, 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 if I screen, change the screen resolution, that should do it, right? Uh, settings, displays. Uh, where's that at? I thought that was here. Oh, the range of display. There we go. 1280 by 800, I was told, was pretty good. Yeah. All right. All right. 
Better? Yeah. All right. All right. One down for Murphy. So, all right, here we go. So uh, basically, here's a PGM file, uh, simple file format, not usually supported by browsers. Uh, JPEG 2000 file, uh, so it's a highly compressed. Uh, uh, my bad. Okay. That should be good now, right? Paul. Okay. So uh, JPEG 2000, which is a highly compressed JPEG image, uh, also not typically supported by browsers. And this is just a small image, which is supported by browsers. You can load it. But I want to show, uh, basically, uh, uh, I'm in the wrong folder, cd dot dot slash. There we go. So, uh, uh, so I want to show an example of what, something a little more exotic that you can do with these kind of things. So if I go to that web page here, which is right here, I can click on these links and, and, and of course, uh, if it was the right example, which isn't already loaded, uh, temp app example one. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so basically, uh, the browser by default doesn't support them. So if you click on them, it'll try to download them because it doesn't know what to do with them. It's expecting you to have some application. The favicon, of course, works as a little tiny image here. So uh, what I want to show you first, if you go to the Brown Dog web page, uh, Confluence, uh, try it. What we have is a piece, a little piece of JavaScript right here that you can add to your HTML. And basically, what it'll do is make it so that you can, in the web page, uh, take care of some conversions. So I just basically added up here to the head. And so what I can do then is add to my links uh, a, a, an attribute, uh, DAP, and specify some desired output format for that file. So I'm just going to add DAP to all these things here, except for this last one. I want to show you XML. Because you can, uh, as I'll talk about later on, is that uh, one of the things you can do with data in terms of making it more easily parsable for an end user application. So if I go back to that page now and I reload it, the little, little brown dog logo shoots across. And if it, wasn't, <laughs> if it wasn't so big, you would see the powered by brown dog thing at, at the side there. At the side there. Oh, there we go. That took care of it. And so basically, the idea now is that uh, these links are all modified. You can see down at the bottom here, uh, these REST endpoints have, been, uh, have taken their place. And so basically, when you click on them, uh, these conversions will just happen in the background of the data access proxy server. So this is a PGM rendered in the browser. This is a JPEG 2000 that'll get rendered in the browser. Come on, it takes a little bit of time uh, to process it. There we go. So you can see it in the browser. Uh, the UIC favicon, which I transferred into XML. So there is no direct way to X. So there's this language called DFDL, which I'll explain later, which kind of is a way of uh, storing specifications in a machine readable format. I wrote one for PGM only. Uh, but uh, what the DAP does is it changes these things together. So there's a conversion from the native PNG to PGM, and then from PGM to XML using a DFDL schema. And so basically, it, it marks it up as XML now. So these are all the pixels. So the idea is you have some image you don't understand the format for. You can get it dumped out to you as XML. I did a small image because it takes a little bit of time with the current version of DFDL that we're using. And so uh, basically, that's the idea of using the, the, the um, in HTML. You can similarly do that with uh, images. So if I go to uh, example2.html, uh, let me switch over back to here. And I'm, I'm sorry, this is a little running over Dave, but I, th I think this is pretty crucial. So, uh, so basically, I have a, a web page with, it, with, it, with, it, with an image in it, and it doesn't show up. And that's because it's, again, a JPEG 2000. It, it's not supported in my browser. So again, what I could do is uh, basically just uh, add my JavaScript call there at the top, and then add here to this image tag this time, uh, dap equals JPEG. And it'll, it'll just take care of it in the background. So I just reload the page. It marks it up. And it's, it takes a minute to load, but it, it'll, it'll eventually uh, pop up for you. So uh, that's uh, kind of one of the uh, use cases we see for web developers. So what I'll do next is go to uh, one I can see for everybody. So what we did also, and Luigi will show one for the data tilling service here, is we made something called a bookmarklet. So what a bookmarklet is, if you didn't know, you can do this, is you can basically take a piece of JavaScript code and put it in a bookmark. And so what you could do then is then run it on arbitrary pages, this JavaScript code. So we made these bookmarklets for the data access proxy and for the data tilling service that'll just basically mine through the images and links on a page and, and replace them with uh, uh, calls to these two services so that you can transform them into something usable or search them in the case of the data tilling service. So uh, what I have here is, uh, again, let me go to example three. Well, I don't think I put that there. So let me go to uh, here. 
So here I just put together a simple directory uh, with a bunch of files that aren't typically accessible in a browser. So again, my JPEG 2000 image, a Microsoft Word document, uh, zip files, which typically you, you're expected to download before you can access and see what's inside them, a CSV file, which might work in the browser. No, nope, it doesn't. Uh, and, and some other stuff, a SID file, which is a large map comp uh, compression format. And so uh, basically what I'm going to do now is I would like to get access to these files in, in, on this web page. And so what I can do is I go back here to my dat book marklet on this Triad page. And so the way it presents itself is we try to make it look like a Mac installer. So basically what you could, all you have to do is drag this icon here up to your bookmarks. And basically it puts this bookmark here which calls JavaScript code on arbitrary pages. And so what I can then do is go back to my directory and then I can call that bookmark on it. And so what it's doing is it's running the data access proxy on all the files on this page. And what it's doing is looking at the file extensions, querying the data access proxy for all the output formats I can reach from that given file extension. And so what it does is if you move your mouse over it, it's added this little menu to it. So you can go through, like for this JPEG 2000 case, and go pick a format that I can actually load. And so it'll actually carry it out uh, for you uh, in the browser. Again, these things take some time. It's all, uh, it depends on the tool, which are all black boxes as far as it's concerned. And so uh, let's see if this, so right now the data access proxy is running two servers. One of them is running this Windows program called Irfanview, which, um, oops, uh, that was not the one I wanted to use. Uh, but basically it uh, deals with, um, uh, deals with uh, these SID file formats. So if I go here to SID and go out to uh, JPEG, uh, it'll take care of it for, uh, for us and render it in the browser. Um, There we go. So that you can then preview the data. So there's also these things. Uh, so, there, there, so zip files, I mentioned those. As you typically, you have to download them. You don't have to with the data access proxy running. You can convert it to HTML, uh, which is what this, well, the way directories present themselves on a page. And it'll basically render it in browser for you as, HTML, as uh, something you can directly access. You, you could then click on the links and download them directly from here. Again, a TIFF is not supported by my browser. So I can recursively call the data access proxy again. And then I can go here and uh, convert it over to a JPEG, for example, and carry it out and then view it in the browser. So uh, other stuff, so I could do this document, uh, convert it to a PDF to view it here in the browser, and, and uh, audio files, video files, and so forth. So um, in terms of time, Dave, I'm, I'm like totally over, right? So yeah, with no, so uh, yeah, okay. So let me just finish up then. And, and <laughs> so so there's audio files and video files. It supports like this. Uh, uh, let me just show that. Uh, FLAC file here, typically not supported in a browser. It's kind of this new open source compression format for audio, converted over to MP3. Played in the browser, uh, and uh, probably the last thing, Luigi, if you want to. Oh. It, it, the last thing, Luigi, if you want to start coming up here, is uh, what, what, what I'll show is what I thought was kind of funny, uh, was uh, Michael Dietz, our colleague here, as we were preparing for these presentations, uh, uh, likes to use open source software. Uh, he uses open office. My colleague, Rob Cooper, who was going over the slides with him, does not have that software. He has a Mac. And so he was complaining and asking one of us with a Linux machine to convert it over uh, to, uh, to doc for him or PDF. And so I spent a night doing this, adding support for uh, the DAP on Dropbox. So basically, I can run it here, and it basically, it's, it took a while because they're kind of tricky. They, they hide their links there and in there. And uh, basically, it, what it does is adds this menu here so that you can then uh, uh, directly download it as a, a PDF, for example. So this one takes about a minute to run, so I'm going to switch to a different menu. Uh, again, the black box, is, the software is a black box. So I have no control over that. This is why you need a cloud uh, with a bunch of them. But uh, before I switch to Luigi and as I wait for this one to finish, uh, let me just go to the DAP, again, emphasizing that this is a service with a REST endpoint. So 8184 is the port it's on. So this is the REST interface to it, again, all in the URLs. Uh, and these are the REST endpoints that it provides you. So for carrying out conversions, for viewing a form to you, so you can access it on the web, another, a number of other information. These are the software servers which are providing the software. So there's two of them at the moment. Uh, this is the software that it has available, just some toy software for this demo uh, on, these two on these two pieces of software. Uh, uh, basically, uh, for a conversion, you would specify convert. It would list off all the output formats that are available for a conversion. You would pick one of them. These are all the input formats that are available for that particular conversion. Uh, and so this is finishing up here and loading. 
but uh, so basically the idea is this service uh, is the, the, the key thing we're building and the bookmarklet is an example application that's using it. The JavaScript that I showed you is also a sample application that uses it. So uh, uh, that's the idea. So I'm gonna stop here. Uh, there we go. Here, here's Mike's thing, Rob Cooper, there you go. So you can view it as a PDF without having open office on your machine. So these are again toy use cases. The idea here is we're, the science is the driving force here, so we're starting to add this kind of stuff uh, uh, for that. Uh, and one of the things we were looking at and right now off the bat is some of the stuff in Pecan, like pulling stuff from the NAR database uh, into the various models in Pecan uh, for that. So what Luigi will show you is uh, the bookmarklet we made for the data tilling service. So I'll try to be brief so we can all get up and stretch our legs, get some coffee, unless Murphy kills me. <clears throat> it didn't kill Kenton. Um, so this is the same uh, bookmarklet, but for the DTS service. So again, the point of the DTS here is to extract information from unstructured data. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and do the same thing that uh, uh, Kenton did. I'm gonna click and drag here to my browser, and then I'm gonna go to a separate web page. I'll pick the web page for our group. So here's a page, there's a bunch of information on this page. Uh, you know, there's the raw HTML and then linked off, there's a bunch of images. Uh, we can see one here, there's multiple images on this page. And uh, uh, the idea here is that we wanna try to extract some information from the images on the page. Now the DTS can handle all sorts of file types. In this particular case, this specific bookmark focuses on images only. So if I click on uh, the link here at the top, uh, we see that we pop up this, uh, this bookmarklet. Uh, in this case, we have this kind of you know, uh, dialogue that says, okay, well, I can uh, ask it to list images in the page. So these are all the images that are available on this page. We see that we have a variety. A lot of these images have people. Uh, some have text uh, in them. Uh, some are just icons. And uh, so all this did was the JavaScript in the page just kind of went through and is listing the you know, local images. But if I go ahead and uh, click on index images, then what this does is it starts, it sent the URLs for the 14 images to uh, our service, right, on the back end. And now the service on the back end starts doing things with those images. Now those things are, you know, the extractors that, you know, Kenton mentioned before. And depending on the, uh, what's in the image, depending on the file type, you know, it will do different things. And so as it's running, um, we can see that 13 were successful. One is kind of sitting out there. So Marfi probably struck me out. But um, if I go ahead and search for, uh, for example, for face, uh, then I can see that I get a subset of the images, right? And there was no metadata on that image tag to say that there were faces inside the image. Uh, it's just that on the back end, our service kind of went through, did some uh, computer vision on the images, and figured out that, okay, I see, in, uh, you know, I see faces over here. Then it sent this, this bookmarklet, sent back information to the browser, and inside the browser, in the JavaScript, what we're doing is indexing that information, right? So that when I go and I click face, I'm actually locally looking for that information in that index. Um, so here are most of them of faces. Then um, I will uh, try, let's see, eScience. Oh, one of my extractors died. Um, let's see. Um, uh, so in the case of ISDA, um, it actually did uh, OCR on the image, and it was able to pick up, you know, the word uh, ISDA. Um, so the idea here is that, um, right, this is running for this specific web page, and it gives us more information about what's available inside the web page. If I pick one of the ones with faces, I think this is a good one, and I click on that link, DTS, then it takes me back to the DTS service. So this page is being served by the service itself. And what it shows me is the original file. Then it shows a few here uh, tags, and we can see that the word face came from a tag, but there are other words that were indexed as part of you know, the tags attached to this particular file. 
uh, down below, I can see that I have two faces, and I can actually right, see the specific faces from the image. Now, it picked up these two. It did not pick up myself or Nick because we're turned around. And we have you know, some algorithms for profiles and, and you know, other ones. In this particular case, I'm just running the frontal kind of you know, uh, computer vision algorithm and the OCR algorithm. So, um, so let me show you just briefly a different web page just to show you that uh, hopefully. So this is the Critical Zone Observatory's main web page. Um, if uh, I come here, I can see there's a bunch of uh, images. Oh, this is a tough one down here. This image always changes. We'll see if, um, if it can pick up that face. Um, so I go ahead and, and, and I ask it to index. I want to see if on the back end I've broken something. So there is a live uh, site for this, which so if you want, you can try it. I can give you the URL. Um, just come and ask me, and it's on the wiki. Um, just don't, you know, do it later so it's uh, not all together and doesn't fall over. Okay. So it picked up this face. It picked up the faces over here. Um, let's see, that one is, no, okay. Anyways, and so we can come over here, we can go back to the DTS, and we can find some information. Here's this face over here, and uh, another face over here. And again, arbitrary tags. We also have support for uh, uh, generic metadata, so in the case of the OCR, the output of the OCR process becomes generic metadata that gets indexed inside the browser, and so you can do that kind of thing. So I'll stop here, um, and I'd take questions. Is there a, a keyword library that uh, you use for search terms? On the, in the client side? Yeah, yeah in the browser. Um, right now we're using Lunar. Uh, which is a port of Lucene, if you're familiar with it, in JavaScript. Um, so that's what we do. It does some basic stemming, and you know, it kind of allows you to have that you know, text-based index. So you know, if you, you know, don't spell the word or you have a verb and that kind of thing, it still picks it up. And we do that in the browser, but we do a lot of other things on the server side for that, for, for text-based retrieval. Um, this is just that we wanted to show that you can actually index the results of the extractions locally inside the browser instead of relying on the, you know, on the server side. Does that uh, answer your questions? Or? Yeah, it's totally dependent on the analysis tools running in the background. So right now this is OpenCV doing the face stuff, uh, Tesseract doing the OCR. Again, towards this idea of a mu software, whatever else you throw at it. Yeah. So they all kind of get run at it. Yeah. So the terms are based on the tool. So you, if you want a, tool, uh, a term for something, you know, some other terms, you need a tool that does produce that. that and so we wrap these tools, and then we decide what output of the tool will add to the cloud of metadata. And we'll describe a little bit how that works and you know, how you can do that uh, later on this afternoon. Perfect. So thank you. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, hello. So, um, how do you, do you have a strategy for dealing with proprietary formats? So, a lot of the instrumentation, for example, that I work with, have formats that aren't necessarily. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, we'll, I'll talk about this later when I describe the data access proxy, how it works, and using third-party software. Uh, we can use the tools, the uh, the proprietary software itself, but that brings up a whole new level of issues with regards to licensing. Mm -hmm. So, right now, all we have up here is uh, open source stuff, uh, but. It is capable of doing non-open source stuff. GUI stuff was the primary focus. We, we saw GUI software as the hard stuff. You know, everybody does command line stuff. So uh, the DAP is designed to do GUI stuff and command line stuff as well. And so I'll describe some of that, but then again, there's the, the issue of licensing. And so we will address that in later years of the project. Uh, it's doable, but there's that. Yeah. So uh, Brian Wee from Neon. Um, so this is a question that might sound weird and recursive in some way, um, but it's like you know finding the, the holy ark of the covenant and asking you what spade you use to dig up the holy ark. Um, the question is, in in terms of provenance, so w it's important eventually, as you had mentioned in in your um, talk earlier, that we eventually are able to associate 
you know, data with code and with publications and link everything up together through IDs and all that. But so the question here is for, for DAP and for DTS, um, the algorithms that you're using uh, to enable these kinds of services, w w will that be traceable eventually through some provenance trace that somebody can uh, request and look at and so that you know which version of the algorithm you use to do those things? So uh, as well as show, I think tomorrow, uh, Ray's giving a talk on, so we're building a, a tools catalog. So the idea is we want, we're, we're gonna, not going to build all these tools. We're not going to wrap all these tools. We can't. We, we need uh, the community of, of users to do that kind of stuff. So we'll build this like app store thing, call it, we'll call this call it a tools catalog, where people can incorporate these, this piece of software there. And it'll be a, basically a registry of that kind of stuff, so you can find them. And as I mentioned earlier, too, one port of, part of this that we really want to push is the idea of uh, when it's scientific software, citing it. So basically, what paper did this come from? Who was the author, uh, if it's, uh, and so forth? So they can get credit for these kind of things, but basically towards that provenance. And so it's not there yet, but the data access proxy uh, is basically building this little workflow behind the scenes too of all the software is chaining together. Because some of these conversions are not direct conversions. It's going through a couple hops. And so right now that's all lost and it really makes it hard to debug actually. But uh, so what we're gonna add is a, a, a true scientific workflow system to it to basically replace that simple workflow that we have there. And spit that out as one of the products it spits out to, a, to another endpoint. Uh, where you can then potentially reproduce the results, uh, see where it failed, see where maybe the intermediary results uh, of the conversion happened, same with the data tilling service, as part of the providence trail for uh, whatever you do with the data. Yeah. Um, by the way, a follow-up comment. Um, so I need to comment you guys on doing the Powered by Brown Dog um, little icon, the thing there, because um, this is what I've been advocating to the semantic technologies community for some years that, you know, if, if you don't do that, at least when you do deal with semantic enabled search, nobody knows that, that there is semantic technology behind it and everybody says like, eh, so what? I, the, I ended the search and all these great data came back to me, nobody knows that it is uh, uh, powered by semantic technologies and so at least when you have that, powered by brown dog, I guess modeled after powered by Intel, it, tells people that yeah that there is a value to NSF funding this kind of research that makes these kinds of searches possible and so policy wise this is a very good move because it allows us to go back to NSF and say look you know this technology is being used and appreciated by the public it's actually based off of Apache <laughs> <laughs> and I just wanted to mention going back to provenance uh, that for example if we look uh, at the metadata technical metadata here uh, we have an ID for an extractor and we try to you know, make all our code open source and eventually we can put this a link back to the open source code that runs that extractor uh, so that like you were saying you can go straight back to you know, exactly the piece of code that ran and get more information. We're very uh, obviously very cognizant of, of a provenance. Yeah. Uh, I think there was a question, no? Not anymore? Okay. Yes, Praveen. So, uh, unlike uh, the naming services and so forth, which are simple searches, uh, DTS is compute intensive in the background. Uh, so, when it gets deployed across the globe, how scalable is it? So, it, it, it's, the idea is it's, it, it's naively parallel stuff. So, these are all black boxes of code. And so, it's very much into this cloud paradigm where you would bring up another VM or another machine and it would basically add to the functionality of the overall system. Uh, this is, unlike a DNS, is, that's very much correct, is very, very compute intensive. So the, the product of the five years of this project is a small prototype instance, which will by no means serve the world, or probably more than a couple hundred people. So uh, basically, my thinking for the future of this is some, some big machines will need to be involved with this. So we will need cloud-based resources, we will need serious NSF-funded cloud-based resources to make these kind of things uh, a reality, uh, and usable by everybody. And I was going to add, architecture-wise, um, this is being built uh, to scale uh, horizontally inside one data center, so uh, or a lab, you know, um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that during the technical discussions this afternoon. Uh, of course, how to reroute to the right data center, you know, internet scale—that's that's a different question. But at this point, we're not even, you know, we're just getting started. So. Yes, we're going to the security question, right? Well, and also the, the data transfer, the um, you know, like the data. Oh, oh 
that, that's right. The question? Yeah. So the the, the question was uh, basically uh, so you're, when you call these services, uh, if it's from a web page, uh, well, from wherever it's at, you're sending data to the services to do the conversion or do the processing. So yes. And so there's that element of this as well of uh, how to efficiently take care of that, right? Yeah, so that's something we're very much considering right now. It, it just uh, is what it is depending on the fiber between you and that uh, the data source. But yeah, that, that is an aspect of this as well. Yeah. And there's also a security aspect of this as well, which we we'll, uh, might touch on today, is that basically these, as services, uh, uh, if you, one of the client applications is your file manager on your desktop, you're sending your files to the service. Do you want to be doing that? So that's something else we're considering.